good. Welcome, Buzzy Kerbox, to the Boardroom Podcast. It's good to have you here, my friend. Thanks for being a part of this. Great to be here. Um, so you're on quite a bit of a, a Southern California tour, or actually all, all of California tour. Uh, sorry, my dog's going off there. Um, Most of California, yeah. I started yeah. up in San Francisco at San Rafael, my friend's uh, 101 Surf Sports, and been working my way down, and now I'm in Huntington, and then heading on down to Encinitas uh, this week. Cool, and, and this is a big tour for your your book, right? It's a, it's a book tour. It's a book tour. Yeah. It's uh, that, I mean, that's the main reason, but I'm having a lot of fun doing it and surfing. And uh, so, yeah, having a good time with it. Let me ask you a, a question that's sort of out there a little bit. Let's hear what, it. what was the last time you attended a live music performance, a live concert? <laughs> the last one was, uh, God, it's been a while. Um, I can't remember the last one. It's yeah. been it's been quite a bit, a year or two. Yeah, a couple of are years. You, are you a fan of of live performances? I love live performances. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, all right. Let's bring you back. The busting down the door era, Buzzy. Um, you sort of come at it from a, a unique perspective. A guy who's on the east side driving over to the north shore. Um, what was was the tension in, say, 1977, was the tension palpable to you, a guy that was driving over and just surfing? Did you notice that something was going on at the time? Uh, I didn't understand the tension. I mean, I was there and I was seeing Rabbit and Sean and surfing with them at Sunset and Pipeline and getting along with those guys and enjoying watching them come and push the limits and and uh, being right in the water surfing with them. And I didn't realize the Im implications and ramifications of their actions that were going on behind the scenes. So I, I wasn't really aware. And then I heard about it kind of after the fact, because I would hang on the North shore and I'd head back to Kailua. So I wasn't, I wasn't uh, full time on the North shore. So I didn't really know what was going on at the time. Yeah. I, uh, I interviewed Ian about, I don't know, two months ago or something. And he mentioned a time, he said, I was asked, I forget how we came to this point in the conversation, <laughs> but he's told me that he caught a wave once at Holly Eva and had to jump on you. And basically you guys rolled and wrestled underwater. Do you recall this wave or this situation? Of course I do. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about so this. What, what happened? Because yeah. It's funny because he blames me for being so aggro in the water. And I say, I learned it all from him. We were in a <laughs> heat at Haliva and, you know, it's like, you know, 20 minute heat and four rides counted. And I was paddling for this wave and he just paddled right behind me and, and called me off. And, uh, you know, normally you didn't do that. If somebody had a wave, you just, you know, honor it and let him go. But he had this approach that right as I was about to catch it, he just spun right behind me and took it. So I went, oh, that's how you do it. So I paddled back out and I did it to him. And when I did it to him, he turned around, jumped off, bear hug, tackled me over the falls. And we both went down and uh, the judges didn't. I mean, I don't think they had binoculars. Or, oh, what happened there? They didn't really see it. There was no interference called. But uh, that was kind of early on the beginnings of uh, the aggressive uh, tactics in the water. And, you know, it was uh, so. When you had to deal with that, I became pretty aggressive in yeah. heats, and and that's that's what it took to get waves. Mister Nice Guy in a heat, you didn't get a wave. So, and and did, have you ever talked to Ian? Like how what happened on the beach? Like how did it all play out? I don't recall what happened on the beach, but he was a big guy. You know, yeah. he's way bigger <laughs> than I was, and I I wasn't going to do anything about it. You know, yeah. and uh, just we let it go. Um, yeah, I wasn't. I didn't want to you know, push the issue. Yeah. I just went, okay, well. Just have you ever, have you ever talked to Ian about it? Like, you know, in hindsight, you know, water under the bridge 30 years later. Oh yeah. We've had a good laugh over it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Cool. Funny. cool. Cool. Um, you had two pretty massive wins early in your career. I guess it was early in, I believe it was 78. You won the uh, world cup at sunset beach, which is a pretty big deal for a guy from Kailua I would I would assume am, am I correct in assuming that well yeah that was you know I'd been I'd been uh 
on the tour, Randy Rarick was putting together uh, uh, trips where you could go to South Africa and Brazil to be in the trials for the pro events because Hawaii, there was a few select pro events, but you had to be invited. There was no trials to get in. So for me to get in, I had to go on tour and then came back and then I was invited to the, to the World Cup. And uh, that's where I got my revenge on Ian when I took him out in the final. So oh. yeah, what goes around comes around. So, <laughs> oh, that's great. All right, he was, stuff. and that to me, that was like a David and Goliath. I mean, he had won the World Cup uh, one or two times prior to that. I mean, he was really a dominant force on the North Shore, and uh, I worked my way through to the final and faced him in the final and and took him out. So that was, I felt like, you know, little little David against this giant Goliath. Well. Wow. Pretty cool. And um, later on, um, well, I, I don't know what year it was, but you won the richest surf contest up to that point in time regarding history. I think it was the Coke event, right? That yeah, was the surf about Coke event in, in Sydney at Narrabeen. Yeah. And what year was that? That was 1980. Okay. So um, between 78 and 80, um, what were you doing as far as competitive surfing? Where were you, um, you know, as far as the rankings and, and what was the tour like for you? Like what, what, what did 77, 78 and 79 look for you? Look like, for well, you? 78 went by winning the world cup that moved me up. That was the last event of the year that moved me to sixth place in the world rankings. And uh, you know, I was on top of the world. I had eight grand in my pocket. I thought I could buy anything in the world. And, <laughs> and uh, the, and then, uh, I had a falling out that year with local motion who had been my sponsor and I started my own label. I started focusing on that. 79 was just not a good competitive year for me. And, uh, I, my, I was just, uh, trying to decide if I was going to stay on tour or not. I, just enough of that. I wasn't going to go for the 1980 tour. And Hans came over one day and said, Buzzy, you're still 16th in the world. The top 16 were invited to all the events. So I got this new twin fin made and decided I was going to go to Australia and, and give it a go. And that's when I had my best season ever. I got third in the stubbies and then won the surf about. Walked cool. out of Australia. I was like second in the rankings out of the first leg of the tour. So that 1980 was, was a huge year for me. And you mentioned that you had a falling out with local motion and you started your own brand. So tell me a little bit about this. I remember the, the Buzzy Kerbox surfboard, sort of the, lo the logo that you had. Who was making your boards? Who was shaping your boards? Well, I, I came up with the logo and then I was having boards made in South Africa. And this other guy in uh, Australia, Dougie Bell in Sydney, was making the boards. And, uh, you know, they were selling pretty well. But it, I was, it was taking time away trying to be a business guy that, uh, you know, just was distracting me from fully committing to the tour. But uh, I got back to it in 1980 and, and uh, yeah, I, had, I was just sponsoring myself pretty much at that point. And then after winning the surf about then I got other sponsors and I worked for a lot of, of different companies and got sponsored by uh, uh, Team Bolt. I became a Lightning Bolt writer with mark richards and bobby owens in the middle of all this buzzy i believe it's in the middle of all this that you you got this phone call about um you know some guy i guess i'm reading here bruce weber some celebrated fashion photographer randomly called you up and and said hey we'd like to do you know some modeling with you so tell me a little bit about that because that's in like 78 right that happened in 78 i was actually in the Royal Melbourne Hospital in Australia. I'd been hit in the stomach by my board at, at Burley. And then I flew down and uh, it's realized I need to go to the hospital. Got really sick on the flight down there and got into the hospital. And they said, uh, you know, you had a, a blunt trauma to the stomach. We think you may have severed your intestines and we want to do emergency exploratory surgery right now. And I went, well, when could I be back in the water? And they said, don't, the doctor's like, don't worry, you can be back in the water three or four months. I go, three or four months? I got bells on Saturday, no surgery. I, I wouldn't let them uh, operate. I just, exploratory surgery didn't, that wasn't in my agenda. So I stayed in there and it turned out 
that my intestines had just swelled shut and they released and it was fine. But uh, while I was in the hospital, I, I wheeled over to the uh, nurse's station and said, can I borrow your phone, make a collect call to my dad? And uh, I told him I was in the hospital, but I was fine. And he said, well, also, you've got, there's this guy, Bruce Weber from New York, that wants you to call him collect. So I put down the phone, asked the nurse, can I make one more call? And I called Bruce. From, I'm from Australia to New York. I don't know what the time difference. And I'm not even the same day, but Bruce happened to to be home, accepted the charges and said, you know, I'm doing this shoot with Vogue magazine. We'd love to fly you out and I'd love to photograph you. I'm like, are you sure you got the right guy? I'm not, I'm not a model. I, and he goes, no, you're, you're the right guy. I saw a picture in a surfing magazine. I said, okay, sounds good. What's the dates? And he told me the dates. I went, ah, can't make that. I got another surf contest. So, but thanks for thinking about me. I hung up the phone <laughs> and went to I went to the uh, surf about, I, I did bells, bombed out. I went to surf about, lost in the first heat. And I looked around for a pay phone, ran to a pay phone, called him again, collect. And he, he answered again, thank God. And I said, is it too late? Is it too late? He goes, not too late. You got to get on a plane. So I flew to New York and did my first shoot for Vogue that ended up uh, leading me into uh, working for Ralph Lauren. Did you know at the time when you're making these phone calls, what kind of money you were leaving on the table to go surf in these events? I, I had no idea. I mean, the, the, for Vogue magazine, I was making, uh, I think it was 75 a day editorial rate for three day shoot. So it wasn't like the lure wasn't big money, but it was just something new and different. And did you ever get to a place where you were like a big time money model? It seems like I, I, I would think that I mean, the amount of times that we saw you all over all these glossy magazines, you must at one point cashed in pretty good. I don't mean to ask you your personal business, but. Well, what happens is when you do the editorial stuff, you don't make much money. But then once you start doing the advertising, that's where the money is. So when I started working for Polo, then the rate was definitely way higher. And so it was 1982. I was still on tour. I got a phone call from my agent. By that time, I got a model agent and he called and said, Polo wants to use you. Um, and gave me the dates and I went, oh, that's not good for me. I got, I got the world cup. I, I can't make that. And, and my agent's like flipping out, Buzzy, this is, this is Ralph Lauren. You've got to take this job. You can't tell and say no to these guys. And it's like, well, I, I'm a surfer first and I, I can't make it and hung up the phone. So Polo ended up uh, pushing their whole shoot back a week and to accommodate my surfing schedule. And then at the end of that, Buffy, who was uh, Ralph's right-hand woman at, at, at Polo, said, Buzzy, you know, what's it going to take for us to have you when we want you with a contract to it? And I said, yeah, that would do it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's where the money got good. Okay, then, so, yeah, go ahead. So then by doing Polo and, and being under contract, but I couldn't do competing clothing companies or whatever, but there was a lot of other opportunities where jobs would just come to me. I wouldn't have to go in the castings or anything. I just got hired and flown in for direct bookings. And, and so through the eighties, the, you know, early eighties, I was very busy with that and still on tour. And, and so you're, you're like 24 years old, you're making more money than I imagine anyone on tour, maybe except for Mark Richards. And, um, and was there, were there some of your competitive aspirations? Was there a conflict for you internally in your heart about, you know, wanting to compete, being a surfer at heart, and then being, you know, <clears throat> in these photo shoots in the middle of who knows where, definitely not at the beach. Tell me about some of that conflict, if in fact there was some. Well, for me, it was like I set these goals early that I really wanted to win contests, and I worked hard for years to finally win the World Cup, and that was it just... It was like a climactic moment. 79, I didn't have that drive. And then I kind of built it up again. And then I really focused on trying to win the surf about. It was the richest contest. So that was a that made that one one that I really wanted to go after. That goal, surfing in New Jersey in two foot waves and the tour uh, those couple of years were not, it was not the dream tour. Most of the waves were crappy and on shore and it, it just wasn't that exciting to me anymore so i just i kind of felt like i had done what i wanted to do and so in 1983 i dropped off the tour i left south africa i left michael ho and hans in the hotel room and said i'm going to europe and i bought a one-way ticket to paris and a Eurorail pass and i just 
took off and started living my life, you know, how I wanted. <laughs> when you, were you working as a model in Europe or were you just like on a hiatus of your own? I just went on a hiatus. I just went, I'm just going, I just want to experience it. And I went all over Europe. That's crazy. That's, yeah. that's pretty random for a young surfer. You'd think you would have gone to like Puerto Escondido or Tahiti or something. Yeah. I went, I wanted to go to Europe and there was one guy I knew on the whole continent, um, Morris Cole, but I had no way to reach him, but, uh, I got on a train and I walked back to go to the bathroom and there he was in the next compartment. And I walked in, I sat down next to him. I said, Morris, what's going on? So, Hey, Buzzy, what are you up to? <laughs> It was just like, it was very nonchalant. And then we're like, oh my God, what? He goes, where are you going? I go, well, I'm going to Monte Carlo. Where are you going? He goes, I'm going to Saint Tropez. I go, that sounds good. I'll get off in Saint Tropez with you. And so I spent four days with him. Cool. And what'd you guys do there? What was that all about? He went and shaped some boards and we went and had some other friends and we uh, just cruised around and joined the Southern yeah. France lifestyle. Yeah that's cool and and were you still sort of receiving calls from your agent or from were you doing work under this contract with Ralph Lauren or were you just fully cruising at that point you know I mean for my for my contract I had to work 14 days a year so it wasn't that that consuming so it gave me time to do stuff and I didn't have anything booked at that time so I was just free flow and then once I got back home I got more jobs but at, at that point I was just out you know seeing the world and how long was your contract with Ralph Lauren? How long did this last? It seems like you were jet setting for a number of years here. Uh, three years, but then they've continued to, to use me uh, for the last 40 years up until two years ago, they did a sh uh, shoot with all of my sons and I. So I did stuff in the 2000s, in the uh, 90s, 2000s, and you know up till two years ago. So it's been a, a good run. And they've continued to use the photos from the 80s have become like iconic uh, polo shots that they still use in their advertising and their Ralph's book. And so it's still a, a part of the polo history. And do you see upside from that? Oh yeah. It's fun to be part of that. I mean, I, I'm not getting paid for that stuff anymore, but it's, it's uh, it, it was, it was cool to be part of that. Okay. Let's, let's fast forward a little bit. Um, we're, in the early 90s right and i'm fascinated by this concept that you're you've got this inflatable boat and you're i don't know for whatever reason you hooked up with laird and you're like let's let's go try to out you know surf outside sunset beach um so tell me a little bit about the very first conversation like how did this go down with you and laird like it must have first it must have percolated in your brain like hey you know, were you thinking Herbie Fletcher from the 80s or like, tell me about the conversation with Laird about, hey, you want to try this tomorrow? Like, what did that, what was that like? Well, I, I had known Laird from a small, when he was a small kid living at Pipeline because he lived uh, in the back house behind Jerry's house. And so I'd known him, but I never really hung out with him or hadn't seen him in a while. And uh, we were, I was on a GQ shoot. It was Sean Thompson and Laird and myself and Laird and I, uh, kind of exchanged notes of what we were doing and he was doing a lot of windsurfing I was doing a lot of windsurfing at that time so he had a place on Kauai next thing I know I went over to visit him on Kauai and we just hit it off and really bonded and started doing stuff together then we started doing paddle races and and playing just a lot of different uh things a lot of windsurfing and we we're windsurfing backyards and and phantoms with uh Derek Dorner and we just realized the quality of the waves on the outer reefs, like from shore, you could see them out there, but you didn't know how good they were. They're really rideable. No one's really paddling out there. And uh, I had the Zodiac boat, you know, from my modeling money, I was able to, to buy that boat and, that, and we would freeboard and tow ourselves around, you know, in, in flat water. And I made a little special 510 board with foot straps for trying to do jumps and fly the wakes and stuff. So I thought we just, I don't know exactly how it came together. Laird's story is a little different than mine, but we kind of just <laughs> decided, well, let's let's take the 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 boat out there and let's try to tow into these waves that we're seeing on the outer reef. So Laird and I uh, went out with my boat, and it only had a forty horse. So we launched uh -huh. we launched from backyards and went out and realized with the forty horse we could barely outrun these things. 
So we got a 60 horse Mercury and came back the next year and started towing. And we, we started getting these amazing rides at backyards and, and we we're thinking we could be onto something. This is, this is kind of fun. It was working. Was there, do you recall, was the conversation about, look, there's some fun 12 to 15 foot waves out here. Let's just get some surf by ourselves. I mean, the early conversations weren't about let's break down the barriers of big wave surfing. It was more no, like, hey. that wasn't that that kind of came as we realized that how good the technique was. And we were at backyards, you know, 12 to 15 footers. And Derek, Derek would come with us and he'd go, well, I'll, I'll ride out there and you guys just drop me off and I'll paddle. And he still wasn't convinced. <laughs> and then we had this this really big northeast swell hit. And uh, so it was Laird, Derek and I and Sylvain uh, was shooting for Oxbow and he's, he called Laird. You know, we didn't have cell phones back then. Called and Laird, you know, where are you guys going tomorrow? Laird said, well, we're going out. We're going to be out there. Just find us. And so Sylvain's sitting there at Waimea watching Waimea. It's like 25 foot Waimea. And Laird, Derek, and I drive by in the truck with the Zodiac headed to Haleiwa. And he goes, ah, where are they going? So we went and launched from Haleiwa and we started headed up the coast and outside Alani Ikea, like a half mile offshore in the deep blue, Derek's, Derek's like, stop here. We're like, what, Derek? There's, we don't see anything. We could see waves farther over. So we waited five minutes. There was nothing. Then Laird's getting antsy. He started to drive in a little bit. And then this like 25 foot set came in of just absolute perfect right, right waves. And so Laird jumped in and got the first ones and, and uh, got, went and rented a helicopter and the pilot said, well, where are we going? He goes, I'm not sure, but we'll know when we find them. They're, they're out there somewhere. So they just drove up the coast till they found us and shot our first session out there. And after that, Derek, Derek was like a believer. Now it's like, oh, I get it now. The to yeah. So from then on, it was, we realized that the, uh, how effective the towing was and, and riding these massive waves with nobody around. And what about the boards? I mean, the first boards that you guys were riding during these sessions, what were they like? Well, they were just our Waimea guns. I had a 9.6 Rawson. Uh, Derek had a big brewer and Laird had a balsa board, a 10.2 balsa that is uh, Bill Hamilton had made them. And uh, we just thought, you know, big waves, you need a big board because you need all that rail. And just so we started on the big boards wearing our leashes. When even, did, you know, yeah. even if it was massive. What about the, the, when did we come down in size regarding the boards? Like how far along, how many years did it take for you guys for the light bulb to go on? Or maybe not even years, maybe just a few sessions. It was, uh, Laird put foot straps on a, on a seven four um, uh, Lopez board, and we and we we're riding that, and and that seemed to be working. And then him and Derek went over. Derek took him over to Brewers, and and Laird said to Dick, you know, I want you to make me something that's going to go faster than any board's ever gone. And Dick said, come back in an hour, and he made him this sixteen inch wide seven four full concave bottom board that uh was just a breakthrough we all tried that board and went oh my god this is so much better and and then so seven four was the length we all got seven fours and then seven twos and we just started incrementally working our way down to like six o's for giant waves but in the beginning it's just you know we didn't realize where it was going it just incrementally took us there trial and error those big boards when you're dropping down they you know the big board slapping and and bogging wasn't as maneuverable, but having those little tiny boards with the foot straps, now, now we could ride big waves and rip big waves as if they were small waves. And it just like was opened up the whole new frontier. And how long did it take for you to, to bail the inflatable boat and just go to the, to the jet ski, the wave runner? Well, at, while we were still on Oahu, Laird worked on the movie End of Summer too, And at the end of the movie, he, they had they had a couple of wave runners that they were using, I think, for filming. And Laird said, "Well, you know, why don't you guys give me one of those wave runners, you know, for my part in the movie?" So they did. They gave one of the wave runners, and we instantly realized how much better that was than the Zodiac. 
but we were in the Zodiac. It was a three man team. We had the driver, we had a spotter. Sorry, let me turn this off. Here. We had a spotter and we had the rider. So it was a three man team. And, uh, and then once the Zodiac came along, then we realized it was, you know, more of a two man operation, but Herbie had towed in, uh, I think Potter and Tom Carroll at second reef pipe years earlier to us using the Zodiac, but I didn't see it. I didn't see any pictures. We heard about it. It wasn't like, Oh, Herbie did it so we can do it. Although it happened, it, that wasn't, that wasn't the path that, that we were on, but we just, it was kind of a similar path that we took a little farther than, than him uh, in those first days at pipe. Yeah. It seems to me that the Herbie thing was almost sort of like, um, like just kind of like a fun thing. Let's like, it seems to me that you guys were really focused, that you guys were committed to this new thing, that you guys were used. I think you saw the future and you sort of ran with it. Um, speak to me a little bit about that. Do you guys feel like, do you ever step back and look at your history in this? Because this was a quantum leap in, in big wave surfing, what you guys undertook. Do you ever think about how, like your guys' importance in this part of history is incredible. Well, when once we... Um... We took the Zodiac and the Wave Runner to Maui. The, Mike Waltz was on the phone with Laird. And while we were on that big day at Lonnie's, Mike Waltz, he's, Laird's telling Mike, and Mike's going, well, while you guys were there, we were windsurfing this spot up the coast, and it might be like a really good spot for your towing technique. And we, we had gone over there a lot to windsurf. So we drove the, the Zodiac and the Wave Runner to Maui from Oahu, it's a 90 mile journey. And we had him over there. And then we started uh, our first day at Jaws. It was like maybe a 15 foot day. And we went, wow, this is a good wave. Like, I wonder how big this spot could handle. We had no idea. And then for the next couple of years, we got more and more swells. It got bigger and bigger. And we realized that that place could handle anything. So what we were doing was, you know, I mean, it's similar to, uh, being heli, you know, uh, snowboarders, and we just found mountains in the background and took our our uh, snowmobiles up and and opened up terrain that was steeper and better than than all the the in, inbounds area with nobody around. And it took a while for everybody to catch on, but each year there'd be more and more and more uh, would would find us and and catch on, and the technique spread around the world. So I mean, we just it happened slowly. It wasn't. I mean, at some point we, we realized that, wow, what we've done, you know, this technique has, has kind of changed big wave surfing and opened up new spots around the world and guys all over the world are getting the best waves and the biggest waves they've ever ridden in their life. And, and uh, so it was kind of satisfying to know that we helped take big wave surfing to, an, to another level. Well, yeah, absolutely. And, and of course on Maui is when um, you guys hooked up with Dave Kalama and Dave, of course, as you mentioned, those guys were all sailboarding Piahi. And so they knew the wave and they knew what, um, you know, the limits that it could be taken to. Um, and then, as I recall, Buzzy, and help me out here, it real quick got really crowded. And, and Laird and Dave, and I don't know if you were involved in it, they put out a video called something like the crazy train or something like that. And it was basically all, like, Hey, all aboard the crazy train. Yeah. yeah. All aboard the crazy train. It was basically like, Oh my God, we were trying to get away from all this. And now all of this has followed us here. Talk to me a little bit about those times. That must've been kind of a, a downer. Well, you know, we did it for a few seasons with, with a uh, very little fanfare. We keep, we take the wave runners in the back of the truck and throw a tarp and, you know, keep it low key and not too many guys realized what we were doing. And uh, the, the first video that, that came out was uh, Wake Up Call. And it was the strap crew trying to sell the concept of surfing with foot straps. But what it sold was the concept of the waves that we were riding it on. And so that started bringing more attention. Then there was a, a surfer cover with uh, Laird and Pete Cabrina. So all of a sudden, and uh, Surfer's Journal did a story. So all of a sudden it started getting this media attention. And so each year the crowd would, would get bigger and bigger and it, it reached a point that it became the most crowded lineup in the world with jet skis like trying to go left from the right and it just it got absolutely out of control so that was that became uh you know frightening but it got to the point you just we couldn't control it in the early days we take turns and if you drive out and sit and stop 
Nine. You know, it, it's funny okay. because in many ways, are you there, Buzz? Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I just, I'm trying to close something out. Sorry. No, no worries. If I can get back to you. I'm here, bro. I'm oh, with there. you. There we are. Okay. Okay. So I find it interesting, and tell me if you um, agree with this or give me some thoughts on this, but because at one point at JAWS, we had so many people and guys that really shouldn't be out there. Like, in other words, if they couldn't, if they didn't have the ski and the comfort of the ski, they weren't qualified to be out there. And in many ways, that situation sort of moved us back to, hey, if you can paddle in out here, if you're a good enough water person to paddle surf, then, okay, you can come out here. And it sort of moved us towards the paddling only, <clears throat> excuse me, the paddling only sort of um, place that we're at now, where if you've got the cojones to paddle in, you're welcome to be out here on a ski, but not vice versa. Yeah, you know, I think what put that over the tipping point was one year this German guy came and towed in and won the, the big wave of the year and he could hardly surf, but he got this this big uh, left, I think, at PI and, and won uh, wave of the year, biggest wave of the year. And so we're like, hey, this guy can't even surf. And so there was that controversy and the crowds were, were getting so thick that some of the guys decided, well, let's take this back to paddling. There's no way we can say, you know, how do you tell the guy, you know, you don't have enough skill to, to be on the tow rope. There's no way to regulate it. We kind of regu self-regulated it for a little bit, but once it got out of control, we just couldn't do it. So Ian Walsh, Shane Dorian, a few of the Maui guys decided, well, let's, you know, let's take it back to paddling. Let's get it uncrowded. And so when they started paddling, when there are guys paddling in the lineup, you can't tow. So that started a, a push towards back to paddling it. And the guys that had the, the, the skill to be out there and paddle it were, were the only ones that could be out there. And, and you know, I think it was around the, the turn of the 21st century, right around 2000 or 2002 or something. But Bill Sharp and Billabong put out this odyssey thing, this this concept that we're going to pay a lot of money to somebody who can ride a 100 foot wave. I think it was, I don't know if it was a hundred thousand dollars or a million dollars. It was some ridiculous amount of money to ride a 100 foot wave. I know that didn't sit well with Laird. I'm wondering how it sat with you at the time. What were your thoughts at this point? Well, I mean, I think that enticed a lot of guys to try to ride the biggest waves they, they, as they could. For me, I never wanted a hundred foot wave. I always told my driver at the time, if a hundred foot wave comes, I don't want it. I, you know, never was my goal to ride a, 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 that big a wave. I just, I, I rode a 60 footer at, at Jaws and that was, you know, exciting to the level, of, you know, I felt, you know, definitely life threatening on that wave. So a hundred foot wave never enticed me. When I started towing, it wasn't because I want to ride giant waves. It was because I want to, have high performance surfing on, on bigger waves and, and get away from everything, you know, yeah. but yeah. It, it was never, never to, to ride a hundred foot wave. So that, that carrot brought a lot of guys that shouldn't have been out there pushing the limits, trying to ride the biggest waves they could. And, and uh, you know, a lot of guys got in trouble. I think it was Jason majors tried to paddle at Waimea. The beach was closed, but he, he thought he could, get the biggest wave of the year by paddling out there. He got out and got almost to the lineup when a closeout set took him out. Yeah. Got, got back to the beach, almost choking. And then they arrested him. <laughs> <So> <laughs> it didn't oh go my. well. <laughs> That's a bad day. That is a yeah. bad day. Well, another thing that you guys did is you did all of this without the vest, you know, the oxygen vest that we now have these canister vests that everybody wears. I mean, Speak a little bit about the wipeouts you took, the, the fear factor that was involved here. Um, I know that, um, you know, I don't know, talk about that a little bit. Well, yeah, in the early days, we didn't have any flotation. I um, just from, from being a surfer, I, I, when a, a wave comes, I, I would paddle toward it, stand up on my board, dive off and try to penetrate as much as I could and get under it. So I'm thinking... You know, if I wipe out, I want to be able to swim under the next wave. I don't want to be on the surface like a sitting duck. That seemed like a real bad idea. And I remember seeing some of the guys, I think it was Dan Moore, might have been the first guy I saw wearing this uh, big flotation vest. I thought, well, that's not very smart. You know, you're not going to be able to swim under the waves. But uh, 
It was January 28th, 1998, when uh, Laird and I were out there. It was the biggest day we'd seen out there. And I showed up about 20 minutes after Laird got there. And he, he had put on his uh, impact vest. When we worked on Waterworld, we got these little vests. They have about a, an eighth of the flotation of a Coast Guard approved one. It was more of an impact vest, but he put his on. And I thought, well, I think I'm putting mine on too. <laughs> and so we started wearing that. And so it did give some flotation. Yeah. And then we realized that, you know, more flotation was better and that actually, you know, it's better just to be a sit and duck and go under a little bit because the, those flotation would really help bring you up. And um, I always, in the early days, it was just a small group of guys. So we were very selective about the waves we wouldn't. I wouldn't just go on any wave. We tried to pick the right waves and ones that were going to end in the channel. Wasn't just going on closeouts and stuff. But as other guys were coming out there with probably less wave knowledge and, and they're just, oh, I'm going to toe in on this way and pulling the barrel and they just you know some of the worst wipeouts i'd ever seen these guys going beyond their skill levels and uh and paying the price but i was always fairly cautious and i didn't have that many wipeouts i mean i saw a lot worse wipeouts a lot of guys than than i ever had but uh well have you let me ask you this um where was your worst wipeout i'm gonna bet it wasn't at jaws i bet during your normal surfing days someplace like sunset beach when when was uh, the scariest moment in the water for you? Probably my scariest was, it was at Jaws. I wiped out on one. Victor Lopez was my partner at the time. Uh, it wasn't a terrible wipeout, but I got, I got pretty beat. I came up, he came in to get me. I jumped on the sled and we were trying to get out of there. And the next I'm looking back, Victor's just driving forward. I'm looking back and the next 20 foot of white water's closing in on us. I like, go, go, go. And he's trying to go with the impeller and the, and the broken water just wasn't going. And that white water just grabbed me off. And I just went feet overhead, spinning, like cartwheeling through liquid space. Victor stayed on a little bit longer. Then the wave uh, took him off and took the ski, our boards, everything up the rocks and just destroyed the ski. And uh, I was uh, pretty worked, but Laird, before I got to the rocks, Laird came in and picked me up. And then we had to go in and deal with the jet ski on the rocks. That was probably one of my worst because I you know, felt like I'm on the sled. I'm safe. I'm out of harm's way. Boy, I'm glad. And then realized that that next one's just took me out and put me in the worst spot. So what's, that was, the, what's the policy for when jet skis are on the rocks there? Like, do guys just, I mean, are there just abandoned skis on the rocks? Well, you got to get them. Nobody wants you to leave the trash in there. So Don yeah. Shear, John Shear, the helicopter pilot, he would come with us, uh, you know, after and blow yeah. a rope and, and, and get them off the rocks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And okay. so he would do it for us. But if other guys, he, you know, he'd have, you'd have to pay him to get it off there. But once, if your ski went up there, it was your responsibility to get it. Quite, a, quite a few went up there. Yeah. I bet. I bet they still are. I bet to this day they are. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so do you think that, First of all, do you think a hundred foot wave has already been ridden? I think so. I think some of the ones at Nazare have been a hundred feet. They sure look like it. Um, I, I don't love Nazare. It's not, it's never enticed me to want to go there. It's kind of a weird wave, but I think it's definitely the biggest wave that uh, anybody's found on the planet and uh, power to those guys that want to ride a giant wave, but it's not a, it's not a PIE beautiful, perfect wave with a barrel. It's a, it's, it's more like a standing wave in a, in a water park or something. It's just, it's different. The way it stands up, the way it breaks, it's, it's, uh, it's big, it's the biggest. And I, I think that certainly they've had a hundred footers, but yeah. uh, it's never, never something that I've, oh my God, I want to go there. I've, I've argued, um, you know, just sort of opined on another podcast that, that I think Kai Lenny is probably the greatest surfer in the world. When you take into account everything, the big picture, I'm not talking about just winning an event at Bell's Beach, but um, what are your thoughts on what Kai Lenny's doing and has done and, and where is his place um, in today's contemporary um, surfing world? Well, I, I've known his dad um, before Kai, Kai was born. I've watched Kai come up and I can only say great things about Kai, about his skill. 
uh, in surfing. I was a judge on the Stand Up World Tour, and I went around, and he was incredible in the Stand Up Tour. I was with you, uh, remember? Yeah, uh, racing. He was incredible racer, uh, uh, kiting for everything he does. He's incredible at. He's he's that combination of somebody that had the skill, and then he got the backing. That Robbie Nash backed him with sponsorship early then he got red bull early so with that raw talent he got trainers and coaches and nutritionists and and the whole package uh at uh, this day i think he's the world's greatest waterman with nobody else anywhere near him and what he can do in big waves um the only thing that i think is has been out of his reach is is small wave surfing the caliber world world tour stuff but i think that what he's working towards and uh it wouldn't surprise me if if he can uh elevate his surfing to uh world uh, world tour stat uh, standards what about you buzz you you know after towing surfing i mean are you what are you doing to stay in the water i know you do some stand-up you probably do some racing are you doing anything like this the stuff that kai's doing with these um this wing foiling or i, I don't even know what it's called to be honest with you fill me in what are you up to well, what I've been doing, I've been back on the North Shore. I was on Maui for 20 years, and now I'm back on the North Shore of Oahu. I've been surfing a lot. I've been surfing Sunset, Lonnie's, uh, not much pipeline. It's a little tough to get a wave out there these days. But uh, I surf, and I've been towing other uh, sort of misto spots on the North Shore. Not massive, but so I'm still in the water. Uh, I did a lot of stand-up racing for years and stand-up surfing, which kind of backed off on just uh so it's been more surfing and foiling came along so i've been tow foiling where we got some spots you can just tow and ride ride the swells for three four hundred yards and right before this trip i just bought a wing so i've surfing this this past winter at, at backyards and the wind's just always so fluky and i kept watching these wingers on the foils just having a ball and i went that's what I want to do. So I just, uh, I just bought the wing. And when I get home from this trip, that's, I'm going to be joining the ranks of the wingers. It's, uh, it's a pretty incredible uh, ride, it looks like. So that's what's the learning, thing. what's the learning curve like for that, you think? Well, uh, apparently windsurfing is, is the biggest help. Uh, it's, it's kiters struggle more than windsurfing. So I've got a, a pretty strong windsurfing background. And I've got a lot of foiling experience already. So putting those two together for me shouldn't be that hard. But if you got to learn all those skills and you've never windsurfed or anything and learning the foil, it's a pretty harsh learning curve. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and can be quite dangerous with that Ginzu knife blades on the bottom <laughs> of your board. So, yeah. but uh, I, I just wrote an e-foil uh, for uh, when I was in San Rafael. And I think that if, if you can learn and go behind a boat on a regular foil and learn the foiling and get good at that and then add the wing to it. But it's, it's a lot of different things to learn at once, but uh, I think it's, it's the future. You see guys, uh, you know, for downwinding, for wave riding, for everything, wing foiling is, it looks like that's, that's the next uh, big craze in surfing. I, I've talked to some guys, <clears throat> Paisel specifically, who's, who's always rousting me to get, to get on a foil. And some people yeah. have told me that that the best way to learn is to go behind a boat and get a feel yeah. for what the foil's doing. But I've had yeah. Paisel say, you know what? I think the best way to learn is actually learn how to catch the wave, paddle into the wave, because popping up on the foil is actually kind of difficult. What are your thoughts? Uh, I strongly disagree with John on that one. I love John. I see him all the time, and he's a good foil. But I think if you pop up on the foil and you don't know what to do once you get there, then yeah. it's it's hard. So I I highly recommend that you learn to ride the foil behind a, a boat or a ski, get some foil skills and then go. And then when you pop up and the foil comes up, you know what to do, you know what to expect because that first pop up and until you get control of it can be very treacherous. And that's, that's a good time to get hurt. Once you get a little better, you're kind of past that and, and you take away the dangers of, of those very early foiling practices. Yeah, yeah. And do you ever paddle into waves <clears throat> on your foil or are you always getting towed in? I, I have done it. I don't like it because usually it's into, there's always people around now. And yeah. I'll go out at Lonnie and Kea on a two or three foot day and there's guys that are just 
foiling circles around and in and out. And it's, I mean, it's fun, but it's really distracting. And okay. when I'm sitting there and I, I don't want to be the one doing that to other people in a lineup. So I try to do it where people aren't. Yeah. And uh, I think uh, we, by toe, toe foiling, it gets me away from the people. And now with the wing, foil that's going to keep me away from the people too so I don't, I don't like to be the dick in the lineup that's just doing circles around everybody yeah no i hear you um that's sort of the ethos of stand-up paddling too when we were doing it you know 20 years yeah. ago right it was like let's yeah. get out of people's way and of course it's turned into this other thing but yeah absolutely. um so tell me about the book buzz let's get to your book you've got a cool book out um you're on this book tour you got a copy of it there um it doesn't matter because this is audio only. We're not going to be able to see it. <laughs> so what's the book called? It's the book's called Making Waves, and it's it's sort of my my story, my life story as my life weaved through the evolution of surfing from from when I started was longboards and shortboards, then the pro tour, uh, stand up, foiling, winging, just uh, my and uh, channel crossings, my time with Laird, things that we did. Uh, covered uh, my modeling, my modeling days and uh, brings up to the last chapter is about solo at 60 when I decided to do the Molokai channel race 32 mile channel race to stand up by myself just to give me a focus to stay in shape so the message is that, that I'm trying to get across is for people to get off the couch and get up and stay in the game and stay active and get out there and keep doing stuff have, find a way to do stuff that's fun, that keeps you in shape. I, I'm not a lover of going to the gym and grinding weights, but I get out there and, and do sports and bike riding and surf paddle that, that keeps you in shape. It's a healthy lifestyle and keeps you, keeps you young and, and healthy. What was that pad, What was that crossing like for you? What, what, did you get a good wind? Was it, was it brutal or did all the elements come together? The first half was excellent. I had my music going. I was in front of all the guys I wanted to beat. I was just powering across there. And then the, the, the current started getting stronger and I started getting tired. And uh, at the closer you get to Wahoo, the worse the current gets. And it became uh, very, very hard. And I got pulled north towards Sandy Beach and I, had to, I went in close by the cliffs which uh -huh. I did on paddle boards and you can get away with it. But on a stand up, you're getting all the refraction off the, off the, the uh, island there. So I was falling, it was strong. It was really, it was very, very hard. Probably one of the hardest crossings I've, I've done. But uh, right near at the end, my, my son came out on the jet ski and kind of cheered me on the rest of the way. I made to the finish and you know I, I wanted to quit many times, but at the end, my, my boat driver uh, saw how tired I was and he just stayed away from me. He's going, I'm, I'm not getting there. <laughs> He's, he's going to want to call me over and get in the boat. I'm just going to stay. He just stayed just out of reach. He could keep an <laughs> eye on me, but he, he couldn't be called in. Hell. But that, that kind of forced me to finish the race. And I'm glad he did. And, and uh, yeah, it was, uh, you know, my, my whole life, it's about been setting goals and, and, and trying to achieve them, whatever it takes. And they, you know, the, the last getting close to it and actually doing it is, is you, you got to follow through and finish it. So help me out here. When you round Portlock, that last little bit's kind of cruisy. Like at that point, you're laughing because you're, you're kind of out of harm's way. Does the finish line end right at the beach or is it out by the point? You, you round the point into 15 knot headwind. Oh, that's right. Cause it's, cause it's, <laughs> so you, yeah, yeah, yeah. you get out of the oh, current yeah. and now you got a headwind. That's so right. It's, it's no easy thing. If there was no wind, it'd be a nice cruise. Yeah. But, I always uh, think about going the other way, you know, starting there and going down to Diamond Head. But as I came in, I swung over. I, there wasn't a set when I came in. Sometimes you can get a set and get a nice push. There wasn't a set. Then there's some reef farther in. And my son's like, go, go, go. Here's a wave. So I start to paddle for it. And the wind just picked up, I, you know, I'm on my 17 foot board. As the wave started to pick me up, the wind just took my board and flung it in the air, flying, oh. the, you know, I had a leash on, dragged yeah. it out. So then as I'm more tired, I got to reset and get back on. And then, so it's a, it's a brutal finish after a brutal channel crossing. Yeah, gnarly. Well, good for you, dude. Congratulations. What are you like, 63 or 62 now? What are you? I'm 60, I'll be 65 next month. Oh, okay, wow, good on you. All right. Well, I'm glad you're still in the water. You are an inspiration to me and to other guys my age, our age, I guess I should say. And um, I'm stoked you're doing it. Uh, what else? What have we missed? 
Um, not sure. That's those are the highlights. You know, yeah, yeah. Uh, I spent uh, 28 years raising my kids. You know, and now my youngest is 19, and so now I can a uh, little bit more focus on myself and and enjoying things and being back in the water. I just I think the key. Um, one of the key things I'm doing is my book tour is I just, I want to educate people uh, on, you know, things. I want to inspire them to, to set goals and, and, and I'm trying to get across an environmental message that we got to all work together to save our planet. Cause the ocean is, you know, what, <clears throat> what keeps feeds us a lot. And, and, the, you know, we depend on the ocean. If we keep trash in the ocean, trash in the air, there's not going to be a future for our kids. So I think, we got to stick together and and look after the planet a little bit better than we've been doing and and hopefully our kids can have a good time on the planet as, as we did well right on buzzy good stuff man um again i appreciate your time today i'm stoked you're here in california i hope you have a great rest of your trip and um and i'm sure i'll run into you sometime soon thanks for being on the boardroom show hey thanks for having me right okay. on adios <laughs>